recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Alert Us webinar series. My name is Jamie Underwood, Director of Marketing Communications at Alert Us Technologies. Today's session will cover emergency notification best practices in the healthcare and higher education industry. We ask that you please hold all questions to the end of the webinar. However, feel free to type any questions in the chat box during the presentation, and we'll be sure to come back to those during the Q&A at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded, so please email marketing at alertus.com if you're interested in receiving presentation slides or video from today's webinar. I would now like to turn it over to today's webinar moderator, Peter Lester, Alertus's National Account Manager in Healthcare. Oh, hey, Jamie, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, one other thing, um, if, if you do want to contact any of the other panelists, um, certainly um, email Jamie um, at marketing at alertus.com and we'll be happy to create some linkage for you. We're very fortunate today. Um, we, we've really got some quality panelists here. Uh, Steve Marash uh, is with uh, Boston University. Um, nice to have Steve on board because he's one of the first adopters in the U.S. when it comes to um, putting an emergency notification. Uh, Josh Milchen is with an organization um, out of Cincinnati, which is now known as Mercy Health. It was formerly known as Catholic Health Partners. Very large operation. You'll see the, st the stats on each of these. And then Brett Martin uh, is with Carolina Healthcare, another very large healthcare system out of Charlotte. Um, and each of the each of them are going to take about 10 minutes. Um, and um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. So the, the first 30 minutes will be from the panelists, and then we'll turn it into Q&A and, and see if we can uh, help you all with some answers. Um, Steve is going to uh, kind of focus on the beginning of, of the whole process because I, I talk with hospitals every day, and it seems as though a lot of them really don't even know where to begin. They may have email. They may have overhead paging. But then you get to the point of saying, hey, how do we even begin this whole process of looking at emergency communication? So um, no further ado, we can get going here. Um, turn it over to Steve, and uh, it's all yours for the next 10 minutes. Steve, go for it. Thank you. Good morning. Um, well, I, you know, you, you folks can probably read as good as I can speak, and you probably won't have a Boston accent when you read it. But uh, Boston University is in partnership with uh, Boston Medical Center. Um, our uh, medical school uh, uh, is affiliated with this, and most of our professors are doctors at Boston Medical Center. It's a primary uh, trauma center here for uh, New England, um, and again, from the university's perspective, we've got you know a large number of students, over 40,000, two campuses that are separated by a um, mile, mile and a half, uh, one on the Charles River and one on the south end of Boston, uh, and a lot, an awful lot of buildings, 400 plus buildings, um, with two very distinct um, organizations. Um, I'm not telling uh, anything out of school, but uh, sometimes we get along much better with each other than other times. Um, and we need to share information about what's going on, as a lot of our um, faculty, our students, uh, staff here at the, at the medical center, uh, in the medical campus, travel back and forth between uh, each campus. So one, one, an event that happens on one side of the world can definitely uh, happen on another. Uh, the interesting part about Boston Medical Center, um, it's the old Boston City Hospital, uh, if you will, the city uh, city hospital for the poor, if you will. Um, we get a lot of uh, trauma, a lot of uh, urban trauma here, and uh, the need to let folks know what's going on from a safety perspective is something we take very, very seriously for our, our nurses, our docs, and our patients. Shall we go to the next slide? There you go. So when we started looking at um, what we were looking for, we, you know, again, I think that's the first step of anything. Uh, you know, back when I was like an, an MIS director, the first part of programming is sitting down with a pencil and a piece of paper and figuring out what you need. Um, our needs were kind of, uh, kind of real simple. We needed to develop a common operational picture amongst our, uh, our two organizations and, more importantly, amongst our incident command system and our team members. How do we let them know really what's happening? Um, we also had a second need. Uh, at the university, we're building, um, uh, well, I'm sitting in it right now, 
the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, which is a, a maximum and high containment building, um, uh, hopefully handling with uh, BSL-4 agents very shortly. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're uh, just saying to the panelists, uh, we have the CDC in here right now uh, going through our, hopefully one of our final inspections to give us permission to work with, you know, things like Ebola and Marburg virus and those kind of things. So in our high containment labs, which is our BSL-3 labs, we uh, had no real way of uh, notifying uh, our workers in those labs of what might be happening from an emergency perspective. So that was a need that we had. And again, better coordination between the medical center and the university. So our priorities, um, believe it or not, is letting one the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Um, we need those notifications, and as uh, we've talked about this, you can put people on call list. We have a, uh, uh, you know, an emergency uh, notification system that we use at the university, as well as at the medical center. We actually have uh, two different contracts with the same vendor. Uh, one for our command and control folks. Uh, about uh, 2,500 contacts in that. And then for the university, we've got um, about 40, 45,000 plus contacts. But you're going to have folks on your, uh, on your campus, in your hospital, that are not in those call directories. You're never going to get them in there. They're, they're visitors, uh, patients, uh, whatever. Um, and how do you let those people know what's going on? Okay. Um, so again, we looked at a lot of different things and the solution we found was Alertus and it allowed us to do a couple of things. It allowed us to tie in all these command centers um, so that if someone's uh, issuing an alert or a phase for an emergency, either at the university or the medical center and our command centers, we want that going to these folks right away so we know exactly what's happening. Uh, amongst both organizations. So again, that common operational picture becomes very, very uh, uh, important to us. And again, as I said, we put about 30 of these um, um, alertist beacons in our high containment laboratories, um, and it's our main method of communication in those BS biosafety level three labs uh, if something's happening within the building or within the laboratory suites. Okay. Um, and now we're looking at what we do in the future with this. Uh, we are probably going to roll out something to do with desktop alerts probably in the next, uh, I'd say, two or three months. We're looking at that with my IT director here. Um, we definitely want to expand our use in our command areas. And um, the whole building automation system, which I'm going to listen to one of the other speakers here uh, with a lot of interest, is how do we um, unify our, our facility notification so that it's kind of important to get that information out very quickly when we vet a situation to let people know they have to stay put or, or leave the, leave an area. Um, we do extensive exercises and drills here, both at the hospital and the university. Um, another um, another exercise with active shooters coming up in November here at Boston Medical Center. Um, and we we'll just continue to push this. Um, we're very proud of the work that we, uh, one of our vendors did with us, and it was actually the first time that uh, we were able to um, develop a seamless integration between our emergency notification system and the Alertus beacon. So uh, uh, that's something we we're uh, very happy to work with our vendor with and with Alertus. And I can just tell you that. Uh, it was a great team effort on both parts of, uh, of, the, of the system, with one vendor working with another to give us a solution that we find very helpful and very useful uh, every day here. I finished under uh, under 10 minutes there, Pete. Yeah, you did. Uh, just a couple of things, Steve, that I'd be curious with, um, if you wouldn't mind commenting on them. When you, sure. uh, as, as, as one of the early pioneers in, in getting emergency notification going there, how did you build in cons consensus? How did you get the, you know, the sea level people to buy into where you were going with this? Um, was there any kind of an event that triggered it, or uh, I'm just curious as to how you got consensus? Looking back when you um, started this, I work for a very good boss, <laughs> and uh, uh, no, we, we we have a good relationship, and uh, it was a need that we identified, and. Uh, 
again, it was uh, something we, we needed to do. Uh, those two those two main things: communications between the hospital and the university um, to our command and control centers. Where I mean, those are our nerve centers here that we have that monitor the situation every day across uh, both organizations. Uh, they actually sit in one room, both public safety and uh, our facilities control technicians. So that is the key thing here down at the medical campus. Uh, something happens, they know about it, and they get the word out right away. And again, it goes, uh, like I said, not only to, to the hospital uh, and the university on this campus, but across to our command centers and our facilities and public, uh, public safety folks on the other campus. The other thing we looked at was that that one area that we had, uh, you know, in our labs, and uh, we looked at a, a couple of solutions. Uh, we went down to a school uh, in Rhode Island, St. George, uh, which was a big user of uh, Alertus Beacons, and we were really impressed with, A, the simplicity of use, and uh, the folks down there decided they were going to show us how this all worked and demonstrate it, and we were walking, we were walking across the campus, and uh, to see an Alertus beacon a quarter of a mile away with that nice red light going off was something very reassuring to us. And we came back with that story. They said, let's just go get it. So we did. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. You, you, you commented on this before, and that is that you have students, faculty, um, staff, and so forth. Um, one of the things that, that um, at Alertus that we've um, recognized over the past uh, number of years is that um, in an open culture environment, and you happen to have that both with the university as well as at the medical center, meaning that almost anybody can walk in the door. Okay, um, but the, the, the one of the challenges is, and and this this happened at Hopkins when they had the active shooter a couple of years ago, is how do you communicate with your visitors? You've got thousands of people going through your buildings, and um, un, until we really worked with them and your and yourself and and getting the beacons um, deployed. Um, it's the, which have been the breakthrough. That's how you know you guys are using that in order to be able to get message out instantly to visitors. And I find that a lot of hospitals just don't have any way of being able to communicate with their visitors. And according to the assessment that was made at Hopkins, that's where the panic kicked in because they couldn't communicate with them. So, but anyway, um, I appreciate well, I, your let insights. Me, let, but, me, let me just say one thing, Peter. The thing yeah. about those overhead pages, if you are a visitor in a hospital, you're probably not paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. You need something to catch your eye right away. I mean, the, the staff may hear that, and they're listening to that, but I don't, you're right. I don't think those people walking through as vis visitors to an institution are going to be paying attention to anything about where they're going. But if they see that bright red, red light flashing, it gets their attention. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Howard Guan, who's the Director of Emergency Management at Hopkins, said exactly the th same thing in their assessment. Overhead paging was useless because you couldn't understand what was coming out of it. But, uh, hey, thanks for the comments and, and so forth on that because uh, it's time for us to uh, introduce Josh Milchen, who's with Mercy Health. Um, so since we've got a lot of content here, I'm just going to um, – you guys that are listening and joining us here can see how, how large Mercy Health is there that Jamie put together. So, Josh, it's, uh, all yours. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Josh Milchin, of course, as you can see that. Um, I'm a lead officer with our hospital in Lorraine, which is Mercy Regional Medical Center. And there's a small description of our campus underneath the Mercy Health system. Um, we are a quite large system, and we were lucky enough here at our facility to be the first, if you will, uh, pilot hospital for the Alertus. Um, how this journey started was probably about uh, two years ago, maybe a little less than that. And basically, it, you may comment on some things that uh, similar as the last speaker. We had a real problem with um, people getting the right information, people not getting information, and then information that was um, coming through that just was it clear enough or fast enough? Um, especially, we all know in disasters and emergencies, you know, communication is key. Um, the timeliness of that information is key and the accuracy of it. And we sat on our, our committees and, and we kept hearing the same things over and over. It, the, the complaints about not getting information, anything from weather related emergencies to uh, potential disasters. If you're a hospital, it's, it's your code yellows, your code oranges, 
um, to potentially active shooter. And of course, we all see these type of incidents increase. And so as we kicked it around, we knew we needed to come up with something better. And when we started our search, I was involved in that ground level search, going out and start looking for something that we could bring to our hospital. And we found Alertus. And with Peter's help, um, one of the first things we looked at was with Alertus is the activation methods. And you'll see that slide up now. And the multiple uses of Alertus and the beacons and the different way that get information out and get information in and processed and the speed of it and be able to set the system up it kind of to you, to what you need it, how it, you need it to work, excuse me, and then getting that information out timely and, and accurate. And as we have gone through certain events, and I can tell you since it's been online this past March, we went through a go live and a lot of testing ahead of time. Um, we have had over 180 alerts go out. And anything from our internet system being down for emails to disasters to potential threats to the hospital and whatever else. And it's really given us a step up, especially when we had joint commission here and they saw the system uh, working. They saw that we had a board up. They saw we went through training to, to our staff and our employees. And here at uh, Mercy Regional Medical Center, we use the desktop alert as well as we have beacons. And our Lorraine market uh, covers two hospitals in Lorraine County, multiple physician offices, our cancer center, our fitness centers. Uh, we have a beacon inside our fitness gym. Because when you put an overhead speaker inside a gym, especially with the noise of the equipment, you're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear the overhead paging, but you're going to see a beacon uh, lighting up, just like he explained. And we have gotten so many comments on it. Um, our staff appreciate what we've done with the system. Um, it was easy to get installed. It was easy to get our communication people trained on the system. and. When we presented all that um, beforehand to our uh, committees and our administration, it was without a doubt they, they approved it. They said, go get it. And we were actually lucky enough to use federal grant money to purchase the alert system for our hospital um, because it's a mass communication system. It's for emergencies. It's part of our emergency plan now. And we can also develop it more uh, like the fire system uh, tie-ins. You can. It's endless. Um, it, it, it's really a wonderful product. Uh, we've taken advantage of. Our corporate uh, has had eyes on it as well, um, and has followed our process here. Um, our actual our server is a on a Alerta sits on a virtual server down in Kentucky. Um, so that's kind of our headquarters for our data center, and so there's like no delay when information goes in. The other um, part that our administration really liked and enjoyed is the fact of that there can be multiple administrators set up to set these activations off and multiple ways to set the system off for alerts. And so if something happens in your communication center and you can't get information out from there, somebody else can do it from a computer on our network. I can do that. Um, so it just, in a hospital, is a 24-7 setting. It's a city within the city. Things are constantly moving. Things are constantly happening. And um, we've actually proven now in our system, we've actually saved a couple lives with the alert system. Uh, we've had uh, patients that were Alzheimer's that end up leaving and getting away from family members. And we've been able to get that information out. And one of our most recent incidents, a gentleman was spotted a mile and a half from the hospital standing in a roadway. And somebody had heard the system, saw it saw where the person belonged, notified us right away, and we got down there and, and got them out of the roadway. So it really is a great tool not only for, for your staff, your facility, for your visitors, your patients. Um, I know a lot is talked about with noise and reducing noise in hospitals. Uh, so when it comes to the desktop notification, that's throughout all of our patient floors. And those computers are active, but it's quiet. It's not, we don't, we didn't put any beacons on our patient floors, but the staff are getting the information. There's always a secretary, there's always a nurse at um, a desktop station that, that can see that information, alert others, um, and then 
you know, follow the, the proper alert information. And so the, the timeliness of it is really expedited. Um, there's no more uh, kind of a handoff, if you will. Our communication used to get a permission to send an alert and had to have a VP's name attached to it. And you had to make sure if you didn't have that, they had to go through and contact those. So really delayed the process of alerts. And again, that, that delay just, you can't have that in this day and age, especially with the type of things that can happen. Um, we plan on ex expanding our alert system here more than just the, the beacons and desktops. Um, and, you know, that I've been fortunate enough to be able to find grant money. I know a lot of people are, some struggle with that and some don't. Um, but it's so far, it seems like with emergency preparedness, there's there's never enough money, but there's always somebody that's willing to, to give it, um, especially for the safety of others and the facility. I, I'd expect our Catholic um, Healthcare or Mercy Health system, uh, other hospitals, there's one other hospital in our system that is piloting Alertus, if you will, and um, I'm sure the results of both of our hospitals, it will expand to the rest as, as the future comes uh, on board. I know I, I have several calls with our corporate risk and um, they definitely want to see the system expand. So it's definitely user friendly. It, it, it promotes so many different uh, factors for safety, fire safety. Uh, again, can't explain enough for your visitors, your staff, your patients. Um, and I come from a law enforcement background. I had about six, 12 years before I came to the hospital. I've got about 16 years now. Um, and that was one of my key things when I came to this hospital. I'm going to make it the safest I can. I'm going to bring in the most technology I can to this facility, uh, whether it's cameras, access control, or alertus with the emergency preparedness. Hey, hey Josh, it's Peter. We only have a minute left, but um, uh, you, you started the process out there from scratch. How did you get buy-in from, uh, from the others? How, how do you do that? I, you know, I used nursing as well as nursing leaders as well as our communication leaders. And, you know, I just, you know, every time we had an incident, it's like, look at, the, look at the communication gap. Look at the gap that time the information went out. Look at, you know, we actually had a gentleman that showed up in a medical office building one day and threatened that he had a gun if he wasn't seen right away. He was going to start shooting. The amount of time that it took to empty out the building, keep him in a room, get others informed, it, it, it was a disaster in itself, unfortunately. And so I used that that type of incident and used you know information and um, that you you know you provided Peter from Alertus to say look we can prevent this we can make this happen better and faster and th that's how we we got the buy-in and then mm -hmm. the grant money was just kind of a bonus on the top. Yeah, just, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, listen. I, I appreciate we're uh, th that's ten minutes. Um, so. Okay. Um, There'll be an opportunity for people to uh, send questions into you through the chat window. Um, the, the, the next is is kind of a little bit different twist on emergency notification because a lot of us focus on active shooter, um, you know, weather events and so forth and so on. But there are other emergencies that are going on throughout all of your complexes and whatever. And um, uh, when we first got talking with uh, Carolina Healthcare out of Charlotte. Um, huge operation, as you can see. Um, Brett Martin down there um, saw different elements of our system and kind of his lights went off and said, well, if you can do this and you can do that, why can't we do something kind of unique here when it comes to integrating our fire systems um, with our communication systems? So Brett really uh, worked very closely with our guys and helped develop uh, a very interesting solution uh, which is uh, commonplace in all hospitals and healthcare organizations. So um, I'm really happy to have Brett on board, and I'll turn it over to him. So, Brett, all yours. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad to be here and glad to, to share our uh, partnership with Alertus. Uh, as Peter said, we have a, a, had a unique uh, situation uh, with, with our system. We're a, a pretty large system in North and South Carolina. We have uh, 39 hospital campuses in both states and um, I get the privilege of uh, helping with uh, the code and regulatory compliance for all the, the campuses. Uh, talk about uh, how do we get consensus. I know uh, Peter's asked that a couple of times. We we had the fortunate um, or sometimes I guess unfortunate 
situation where it was triggered by an event. Uh, we, we, we had a, a, a standard fire alarm system that uh, was using a manual process for code red notification. So when the fire alarm went off, somebody at a panel would uh, recognize the alarm and, and would, would take some proactive approaches to, to do the overhead paging or send out emails. And uh, at one particular event, uh, the maintenance guy was doing some service and he took the fire alarm system offline, what he thought. Uh, but uh, there happened, Murphy's Law occurred and there happened to be an event in the kitchen where there was an actual grease fire that set off another suppression system. Uh, the fire trucks responded. In the process of the fire department responding and being in the kitchen full of smoke and fire, they heard over they, they they heard over the overhead paging system. Please disregard the fire alarm. This is only a test. Uh, so, needless to say, uh, the the event triggered uh, easy consensus with our senior leadership, in that our system had to be looked at and reviewed and and corrected. Uh, and it turns out that after that review, we discovered that there was an abomination of a mix of systems and platforms, and it was a manually intensive process. Uh, in order to save uh, full-time employees, they decided to go to a central calling location for alarms. So somebody sitting at a desk would uh, receive uh, a call or receive the fire alarm from the panel, and they would go through this manually intensive uh, iterative process of, of addressing and going through the paging process and mass notification process. And it just didn't work. Uh, when we analyzed it, we got into it, and it was a on average, it was 172 seconds from alarm to overhead page or notification. Uh, and those of you in the healthcare industry know that, that time is of the essence in notification because we're entrusted with our local authorities having jurisdiction uh, on a thing called defend in place. And the defend in place is that we don't evacuate our patients. We have response teams that immediately go to the source of the fire. We try to fight the fire. We try to uh, keep people in place until absolutely necessary to evacuate. And so time is of the essence in, in determining the cause of the alarm and having a, a human element response. And we just didn't have that. So um, basically we went out uh, and partnered with Alertus for a code red uh, automatic system that would be a broad spectrum notification to fire alarm events. Uh, it, it basically, it had to have the ability to read what was coming from the fire alarm panel and then take that, that, that message coming from the fire alarm panel and distribute it in all the, the multi-mode means of communication that we needed, one of which was digital in-house paging. We believe it or not, we had an old, we still have an old antiquated system called Zetron, which is the old Motorola paging system where you have an antenna on top of your building that sends the radio signal to all the Motorola pagers. Physicians and staff still use that system. So we had to deal with that. We had to distribute emails to the appropriate predefined email list. One challenge was using uh, technology to recognize the truncated fire alarm signals. A fire alarm panel only allows 24 characters to describe the alarm. And so what is commonly referred seen as an abbreviation of 1-S-T-F-L-R-S-D actually means first floor smoke detector. So uh, if you had a human trying to read that alarm and they weren't familiar with that abbreviation, they had a hard time interpreting that. Also, if you, just did, if you didn't convert that to plain text English, if you just sent that message out through a beacon or through the alerted system, a lot of the people receiving that or the intelligibility, like uh, Peter mentioned earlier about overhead paging, if you don't make it in plain text English, people will not understand what the overhead page is actually trying to tell them. Uh, so we had to come up with a smart technology to recognize these abbreviations. Alertus did that for us. We built a 980 character library that the Alertus system can actually recognize these abbreviations and spell them out. We also needed text to voice because we wanted to do overhead paging automatically. We wanted the alerted system to seize the phone uh, system, the uh, overhead paging at each of the facilities so that it would perform the pages in accordance with the criteria established by our authorities having jurisdiction. Uh, we needed uh, to basically identify the device. We wanted to identify what was causing the alarm, where the alarm was occurring. 
and we needed to have a system capable of 100% uh, uptime with self-diagnostics because it is a fire-related system tied to fire safety. Uh, and all of these components were uh, critical to us to make sure that the system was reliable and increase the reliability over what we had with a manual process. Next slide. This is a, a very simplistic view of the, uh, the way the system works. Now, as you've heard in other uh, uh, presentations, the Alertus beacon is used actually as a communication device, and, and, and we don't use that. That is, this device is tucked away in one of our comm closets uh, because we're not actually using it as a communication device, uh, but we're using it as a mechanism to get our communication out. Uh, but the premise of the, uh, the system is that we're reading off of the fire alarm output through an RS-232 printer output cable. And that's all it is. The printer output from the fire alarm panel gives a signal to our Alertus fire alarm control panel, and that will recognize keywords like fire alarm. And that's what triggers the Alertus system to recognize that signal and go into the, um, the alarm uh, communication methodology. Uh, it go, it's all through our land-based system that communicates with uh, virtual servers uh, through our main, uh, you know, uh, information uh, services system. From that land, that message will uh, get processed and distributed to our, our beacon, which will also uh, talk to a text-to-speech module that will seize the overhead line. It will also send smart messages to smartphones, uh, PDAs, computer terminals with pop-up screens at key locations like security stations. Uh, and it also sends to a switch. Uh, and this was really a, a testament to what Alertus could do for us in customizing this because we had to uh, develop a switch that would interface with that Zetron Motorola pager and send that signal out on the, on the Motorola pagers. Uh, and so the system all interfaces with uh, multi-modes of communication that gets the message out to the right people so that they're responding to the fire alarm. Next slide. We've got about two minutes, Brett. Yeah. Statistically, uh, we, we, did, uh, we still demonstrate 100% system uptime. 99% of the receipt of the, the code reds were going across. You know, we had a, a very high failure rate. Uh, like I said, 172 seconds was the average. We actually had some code reds that took over five minutes because a, a system uh, needed to be rebooted. Uh, five minutes is way too long to get a code red message out. Uh, so uh, we had 99% because we actually had one person that didn't respond to our questionnaire during our pilot. 94%, uh, of course, the tenability of speakers, that makes us go back in and adjust our overhead speakers so that we have volume and tenability uh, corrections. Uh, we went to an average time of 22 seconds from, from 172 to 22, but keep in mind that's a build-in of uh, less than um, 60 seconds because we had a 15-second uh, delay before we can silence alarms. So that includes silencing the alarms and actually sending the message overhead on the page. And then, of course, uh, all of our emails and Motorola paging systems were less than three seconds to deliver the message. So uh, it's been a phenomenal system. We piloted it in two hospitals. I have it in eight of my facilities now, and I expect to do anywhere from two to four installations in 2015. So we're really, uh, we're really happy with this application, and we hope we can expand it into other applications of uh, codes and conferences paging. Okay, you must have practiced that because you're right at 10 minutes. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, excellent. Thanks, Brett, for that. Brett, would you mind sharing with all of us that, um, that one event that you had happen uh, going back where um, a water main broke um, and what happened with that? Yeah, this is a, this is a good uh, kind of a side loss event uh, that, that saved us a lot of money. Uh, water is our enemy in healthcare, as, as most of you know. Uh, we had a uh, four-inch uh, uh, sprinkler riser during our cold spell in the winter uh, this past winter. Uh, it doesn't normally get too cold in North Carolina, but we, we have weird ones, and it got down to around four degrees for several days in a row back at the, the beginning of 2014. And, of course, we had a pipe freeze and, and bust in a stairwell, and we had cascading water coming down steps. And because of the alertus notification system, 
it monitors water flow alarms and gives me a, an indication uh, within three seconds, so through email and pages, of which water flow device is actually flowing water and where it's located. And so as a result of this, our staff, uh, our maintenance staff, were able to get up to that stairwell very quickly and isolate that event to prevent uh, you know, what basically was a pretty large loss event for us, but it could have been much, much worse. Uh, they were able to shut that water down in less than about, I think it was maybe five minutes to seven minutes uh, by the time they, they got their message and got up there. But uh, a lot of times that could be a whole lot longer when you're flowing that much water. So this dramatically reduced the, uh, the loss potential associated with the flowing water, that four inch riser that had busted. Yeah, good. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Yeah, yeah interesting um, solution to the event. Okay, uh, Jamie, um, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you so that maybe uh, you've got some uh, Q&A that you'd like to get into, and um, we can go from there, and, and um, it's all yours. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so we now sure. like to open up the floor for Q&A. Um, just a reminder, you can use the chat box to type and submit your questions. We also ask that if you have a question for a specific panelist, please specify that um, next to your question. Uh, we've got the list of, of names and associated organizations here. Uh, so just indicate the name or the organization um, if you would like to direct your question toward a specific panelist. Um, so that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and it uh, looks like we have quite a few questions already, so we'll go ahead and get into some of those. Um, the first uh, is for Steve, I believe. Um, Steve, during your presentation, uh, you were talking about uh, command areas. Uh, the question is, you know, what exactly do you mean when you say uh, expand use in various command areas? Well, um, we're going to a more centralized, decentralized approach to our command and control during uh, uh, events. Um, so we're probably looking at uh, putting some of these beacons in areas where, I mean, we had a lot of lessons learned from the marathon bombing uh, over a year ago that, uh, you know, you're, you're not really working totally out of your, your, command, your formal command center that we have here in our power plant, as well as our control center. But you may need to set up, um, if you will, operational command centers across the, the hospital um, where staff can go and keep doing their work, but again, uh, maintaining the operations you have during a, a major crisis. And I think uh, who knows what's about to happen with the, uh, I don't know what the right word to say, but with this current um, infectious disease uh, situation, uh, I think we're going to see more of that rather than less of it. So we're just trying to be able to communicate back and forth better quickly uh, with uh, with our staff. So um, we like the decentralized approach, both, both here at the hospital as well as the university, and that's kind of how we're going to uh, communicate very quickly about what's going on. And again, that common operational picture when something happens right away. Uh, Steve, this is Peter. And, and uh, with going decentralized, what's the impact of that, and, and how do you uh, or, or can you enable other people to have the authority to be able to use the system, or does it have to come back to to, to some central point for clearance on, on on those that can use it or want to send messages out? How do you how do you manage that? Well, I think what we we do it uh, probably a, a most effective way is to uh, do it once you have a, a large scale event. Uh, we're big fans of the Incident Command System and, uh, and NIMS from the National Incident Management System. Uh, we use, uh, I guess I can say this because it's not one of those other vendor things, but we have an incident management software that we use uh, where as long as the Internet's up, uh, everyone's on it, and that also helps us communicate back and forth remotely. So that allows us to have that whole decentralized uh, virtual command center across large areas of uh, of uh, the hospital as well as the uh, university, mm -hmm. and that information would flow up to the probably to the uh, um, planning section chief to put that information out to the information officer. Okay, good. All right, good. Thanks. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, next question uh, actually is for you, Peter. It's more general. Um, in talking about the alert beacon, um, can you give an idea of how large the alert beacon actually is? Yeah, uh, sure. The, the physical dimensions are eight inches by eight inches by about two, two and a half inches uh, deep. 
those physical dimensions came about from focus groups we held uh, way back when um, hospitals um, uh, did not want something that would be um, overly intrusive when they're um, wall mounted in their large lobby areas, their busy hallways or their cafeterias, <clears throat> but they did want something that would become very um, um, intrusive when an alert occurred. So when they activate the beacon, not only, do, as Steve has mentioned earlier, not only do you have the flashing red lights when it's when, it, when it's in an active mode that are um, that are scrolling around the perimeter of it, but you also, and this is very important, you have real-time digital signage right in the center of it, and that's the breakthrough and has been the breakthrough for healthcare, uh, being able to communicate with um, their visitors and uh, independent contractors. Uh, and, and, and there's a big issue here because, as Steve also mentioned earlier, um, when it comes to faculty, staff, students, and employees, and so forth, you've got most of those people are in in an active directory and set up by groups through LDAP, and, and, and of course we you know we uh, um, we inter we uh, integrate with all that stuff. But um, you 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 don't have the visitors, you don't have the independent contractors in your directories. So if they're not in there, they're not going to be getting. Um, the uh, you know the alerts and that's how the beacons uh, you know came to be used. I don't know whether Steve's doing it up there yet or not, um, but at Hopkins, um, when an alert beacon goes off in one of their large lobby areas, they're actually using a RS-232 cable from the beacon up to a much larger plasma screen or an LED marquee above it, so that people that are much further away will be able to read the exact same message the moment the beacon activates. But uh, those are the, the, a longer answer maybe, but I want to give you a little bit more information than just the bare um, physical dimensions of it. Great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, sure. next, next question here is for Brett. Um, in talking about the water flow sensors and the way that you used the Alerta system in connection with that, can you speak to how the system, how the Alerta system actually connects to those water flow sensors? Yeah, actually, uh, everything comes through the fire alarm panel. So um, uh, that means our smoke detectors, our water flow devices on our sprinkler risers, our pool stations, or even our fire suppression systems like halon systems or cooking hood suppression systems. <coughs> All of those are tied into the fire alarm panel. Uh, and the fire alarm panel then when it has an alarm or one of those devices activates, it will uh, pick up that addressable ID for that particular device, whether it's a smoke detector or a pool station or a water flow switch. And so the Alertus recognizes the, the RS-232 printer output of that fire alarm panel that is identifying that addressable device identifying the fire alarm, and then that's what uh, Alertus does, is it, it uses that smart technology to convert all of that information into a, uh, an intelligible, you know, plain English type message. Great. Thank you, Brett. So uh, we do still have about 15 more minutes. Um, if there are questions, again, we really encourage you to type your question into the chat box and submit it. Um, we'll have our panelists, uh, you know, give a response. I see we do have a couple uh, additional questions here. Uh, Peter, I think uh, the next one's probably one that you could address. Um, in talking about the Alerta system and ways that it can be used, um, can, how and can uh, the system be used for a tornado warning? Uh, yeah, uh, a good question. Yes, it can. Um, th there are a number of ways in which you can do that, meaning that you can have multiple ways of, of getting weather um, alerts, multiple feeds, could be an RSS coming in from National Weather. We actually have built into our software um, a weather warning um, application that our technical people preferred, which is called Threat Watcher. It allows you to set up all kinds of filters. So as an example, the the closer a uh, tornado or or some kind of a of an adverse weather system gets to you, um, the number of updates that are coming out of NOAA can almost get to the point of being overwhelming. So, in the in, in using Threat Watcher, uh, and I'm sure others you know could do, could do maybe some similar things. You can set up filters where you can say, I only want weather um, notifications when they get to the watch level. 
I only want them when they start to hit this zip code or this group of zip codes. And what's nice about the the system is uh, we pass those um, messages through um, without any human intervention so that they can uh, hit the alert of server and go through distribution to whatever endpoints uh, you know the healthcare organization wants those um, weather warnings to go out to so it doesn't have to go to you know somebody in security or somebody in police or whatever and then they have to turn around and and uh, and forward that message on uh, it, it happens automatically great thanks Peter um, our next question is for Steve sure. um, Steve uh, I recall you were talking a little bit about the Alerta system and uh, the fact that it can really integrate with a lot of other products, a lot of other systems. Um, you were speaking to the process of installing the Alerta system. A uh, question is, who is Boston University's emergency communication vendor that actually did integrate with Alertus? Um, we use um, SendWord now, um, and they created that. They, they worked really close with the folks from Alertus. Um, uh, it was, a, it was, I would say it was a lot longer on the send word now side than it was on the alerta side to develop that, but uh, it was the first time that was done, I believe, and it's just, uh, on my panels now, I just picked that as another device um, to, our, to our emergency notification system, so uh, it works. It, it's one step, it's integrated, it's, uh, it's ease of use, and that's what we like about it, make it as simple as possible. Yeah, what, what's nice about that is, Peter, by the way, what's nice of that, about that is um, whatever text messaging service your, your dispatchers or those that are authorized to send out text messages are currently using, um, we can uh, usually integrate with whatever that vendor uh, may be. Um, you know, Steve was one of the earliest, again, to pull this off with uh, SendWord Now, who we continue to work with, and, and we do work with all the others. Um, so uh, if you if you have one and your dispatchers are comfortable with it, um, all they do is exactly what they're doing. There's no behavior change, and we just add all the other alertus endpoints um, um, to make it easy. Excellent, thank you. Uh, well, I believe that concludes our Q and A session. Um, I would quickly like to um, welcome everyone here to register for some of our upcoming webinars. Uh, we have two coming up next month, as well as two in December. Um, and actually, next week, I will be having uh, a best practices and reviewing and updating your emergency preparedness plan. Uh, that should be a really great session. We're looking forward to presenting on that. Uh, following that, later in November, we'll be uh, hosting a session on emergency communication systems for boarding and prep schools. Uh, that is, of course, also applicable to colleges and universities, as well as public school systems. Uh, December, we have a really exciting session on uh, best practices in the event of an active shooter. Uh, we have uh, several panelists joining us for that. It should be a really great session. Uh, so, you know, we hope you're able to join us for that. Finally, uh, our last webinar session of the year uh, will be an Alerta system overview, and it will actually focus on that fire panel integration um, that some of our panelists were speaking to today. So if you're interested, looking for more information, uh, we highly recommend that you join us for that session. Uh, you can register and join um, using uh, the website address here, www.alertus.com backslash Alertus webinar series. Go there for more information um, or to register. Uh, finally, if you would like presentation slides or video from today's webinar, uh, please do email us at marketing at alertus.com. Similarly, if you have any follow-up questions regarding Alertus, our products, um, or additional questions for our panelists, please do feel free to email us also at marketing at alertus.com. Uh, we thank you for joining us today, and uh, we hope to see you at some of our future webinars. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks to the panelists. Jamie, nice job, as usual. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.